Right, thank you very much, Sam, for that introduction. I'd like to thank Perry and the charity for asking me to give this talk. I, I thought it was going to be easier than the, the last thing I did for the charity. This is me at the end of the uh, Roma Ostia half marathon. That's my friend James. I didn't ask him whether I could use his photo, but he's a journalist. He works for the BBC in Rome. He won't mind. He's a hack after all. But after, now that I do realize I have to follow these uh, world experts in the field, um, I think this might be equally hard. Okay. As Sam mentioned, I used to work at UCLH. I'm quite glad to move to Barts because UCLH is in a rough neighborhood. This, this, this poor 73-year-old man was beaten up just on the doorsteps of the hospital in Fitzrovia and was admitted to the A&E department. And uh, he got a thorough workup, and they, as they were patching him up, they saw he had an abnormal ECG, which prompted him getting an echo, which prompted him getting a cardiac MRI, which prompted him getting a second cardiac MRI. And then someone spoke to him and said, what's that scar on your wrist? And he had had carpal tunnel syndrome, but actually released some years before. This is his ECG showing uh, septal Q waves, possibly small complexes. This is his echo showing a very thick, concentrically thick heart. And then we did a diagnostic test. So this is a technetium DPD scan, the bone scan, which we've heard mentioned by Professor Merlini, and a lot of the work I'm going to discuss has been done by the Bologna group by Professor Rapetzi there. But here you have early and late whole body images showing there's retention of the tracer in the heart, and the spec CT Im images show that there's uh, definitely um, asymmetrical septal uptake of the tracer in this man's heart. So he's got a diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. He went on to have an endomyocardial biopsy, which showed positive staining with Congo red stain, apple green birefringence. This was amyloid. He then went on to have gene sequencing, and he has wild type amyloidosis. So maybe he was lucky that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or maybe not. <laughs> Another patient we saw recently, she had palpitations of breathlessness. She had conduction disease. She was found to be in a, a heart failure with a poor ejection fraction, a dilated cardiomyopathy, and due to other constellation of other signs and symptoms, um, she was thought to therefore have cardiac sarcoidosis. This is her ECG. She was also having runs of SVT. She was treated with steroids empirically, given heart failure medicines, and she got a lot better. Two years later, they stopped the steroids, but then her breathlessness recurred, her cardiac function deteriorated. This is her echo, again showing a globally poorly contracting LV. We did a cardiac MRI, getting sinews and volumes, getting a homogenous signal on stir. The late gadolinium shows that there's rather sort of lumpy, patchy, mid-wall, possibly a little bit of transmurality there in the mid-lateral ventricle, uh, uh, in the mid-lateral wall. But actually what we did was a cardiac PET MRI, we also added in her FTG. And in the middle of that scar in that posterior wall, there's uptake. So now in a thing which we think is dead, scar, there's now an active biological process going on. So this woman on the back of this was restarted on her steroids and her LV function improved. Right, so Mike Ashworth gave us a superbly illustrated talk on, on the myocardial pathology because all of this is going on and the pathologist has these array of stains that he can use to work out what's going on in the heart. And it's pretty much the same for us images. With MRI creeping from a black and white word, world into color, with new mapping techniques and color lookup tables, you can possibly identify in the living patient all these different conditions. And the same is true with nuclear imaging where you can look for amyloid infarction, new vessel formation, inflammation, innervation, all these processes. So the challenge is to put them together for the benefit of the patient, patients promptly to enable their clinicians to give them diagnoses so the correct treatment can be instituted. So, when I first gave him the lecture title, I thought, oh my God, he wants me to talk about everything in 20 minutes. But then I went through one of his guidelines and he said, all you need to talk about is amyloid and sarcoid. <laughs> so I might just sit down now. <laughs> Because that's the only area of overlap. I just want to point out on the top left-hand picture, the pale pink stuff is the interstitial deposition of the amyloid. That's where this is all going in, wrapping around the myocytes, which are the darker pink things. Because that will come up again. Okay, so we've heard um, from Professor Malini, um, but it's in, this thing is incredibly common in autopsy series. Up to eight, 20, a quarter of people over the age of 80, when they die and donate their hearts, they have amyloid there. So we're not, not diagnosing that proportion of people 
before they die with this disease. So is this bystander amyloid or does it actually give them some sort of toxic effect to their heart? And as we've heard, there's new treatments coming on, st on stream. So it's important to make the call. It's also important to differentiate between the different types because, as we've also heard, some have a much worse prognosis than others. So MRI really is a mainstay here, and this is the classical pattern that you will see, long described of this global subendocardial late gadolinium enhancement. Okay? But actually, it can be quite tricky to do an MRI in an amyloid patient. They often have arrhythmias, AF, which means that it's difficult to get the heart still. They can't lie in the magnet for an awful long time because they're breathless, because they have fluid around their heart and in their lungs. So they can't hold breath hold. And the classical thing which makes people think, hang on, this could be amyloid, is you can't null the myocardium when you want to do late GAD because of that, instant, that whole global process that's going on there. And of course, as we've alluded to, late gadolinium and Hartzman patterns haven't always read the articles, and they do different things. And again, amylo uh, late gadolinium technique is great for focal bits where there's normal versus abnormal, but when you've got a process that is affecting the whole heart, you don't know where to start and to stop. And again, we need a method which is quantitative, some possibly that we can track over time. And if you're going to give IV gadolinium, you need working kidneys. And as we've seen, the, the amyloid tip picks off your kidneys. So going back to the, that pale pink area, the hallmark here is this massive um, existential expansion. This is an example of the EM over aortic stenosis, but the principle is the same. And gadolinium is an extracellular contrast agent, and this is where it loves to go. So if we achieve steady state with gadolinium over time and measure basically the signal changes between the blood and the myocardium, we can actually measure that extracellular volume expansion as long as you know the volume of distribution in a, in a FBC's blood tube. And if we do that across a range of diseases, Amyloid is the one on the far right which is way up there. The only thing which is, gives you more expansion of your extracellular volume is a heart attack, where the cells die and all you're left with is the space around. And we've seen that as your suspicion of amyloidosis increases, the larger your extracellular volume expansion is. We can now basically type you out according to that ECV expansion, possibly measuring that deposition of amyloid. If you can't give GAD because the kidneys are finished, then we can go back and actually just measure the T1 relaxation time of the muscle. And here we find that that is again lengthened in patients with amyloidosis. And again, the same sort of dose respondent thing possibly may be happening. The T1 times lengthen as you have more amyloid in your heart. So what can nuclear do? Well, we've seen some of these SAP scans. What they do is they label serum amyloid P. This binds to all amyloid proteins in your body, and they label it with iodine in this case. But these scans are exquisite for showing the liver and spleen burden, but they don't show the heart. Now, this may be because actually it's quite a chunky molecule. It can't actually get into the heart. Um, and it may be that actually the heart isn't very permeable to this stuff. Or it just may be that it's just the resolution simply isn't there under this sort of scanning technology. So something else was needed. And it was a serendipitous observation that using a bone-seeking tracer to do regular bone scans in patients with polyneuropathy when they had some of the inherited forms of amyloid, that they actually, instead of the bones also lighting up, the heart also did. This was observed some years ago. And then in Bologna, they typified that actually this may actually be a great tool for diagnosing TTR amyloid. In the early days, we thought that there was no overlap with AL amyloid. But subsequently, with uh, further experience, we've seen that it overlaps. And the scans are very easy to do, unlike cardiac MRI. You inject the bone scan tracer, or you do a quick sweep straight away. Three hours later, the patient comes back, lies on the couch, and you get these sort of pictures. And you can score the uptake from nothing on the left-hand side to a grade three, where the heart seeks all the tracer, and you can see now the bones are beginning to disappear into the magnet. But as I said, there's some overlap possibly with AL amyloid. This is not perfect test for TTR at all, such that there is actually a low degrees of um, cardiac, uh, cardiac uptake with DDP are seen, DPD Begbon are seen when you have AL amyloid. So if you get a positive case, you still must work them up with serum light chains, benzodiazepine, urine proteins to make sure they don't have something like myel multiple myeloma driving their condition. So how do we use it? Well, we used to work at the Heart Hospital, and there we had got our tertiary referral service for cardiomyopathy. And Perry was the person who said, please do DPD scans, please do DPD scans. 
And I said, what is the DPD? And anyhow, no, we, we, we got hold of it and we used it. And we, so this is, uh, since then, uh, scanned 70 patients and our hit rate is around 9-10% of positive cases in slightly younger than that 85% population, six, mid-60s is where they're coming. So, and then we've made, essentially made the diagnosis in those people with unexplained cardiomyopathy, sorry, unexplained hypertrophy. I should also say that when in my, in my practice, in that scoring system, I don't score patients with a one, which possibly means that they're already presenting too late. Professor Malini was talking about early diagnosis. Maybe by the time these people work their way through the system, they've already got enough hypertrophy and enough amyloid deposition that it, maybe we are missing that boat. So maybe we still need to dial up our suspicion even, even further. So of the 70 people we scanned, perhaps uh, Perry is not so suspicious, Professor Rapazzi, because only, only, a third, only 36 of the 70 had had cardiac MRIs. I thought it would be more. And, on, and in some of those MR scans, the amyloid was suggested, either because of the difficulty of nulling, possibly because of the late gadolinium enhancement, but only two of those were DPD positive. And all the MRI scans, which are never raised the suspicion of amyloid, equally the DPD scans are also negative. So actually the two modalities agreed on that because there were so many negatives which concurred. There's quite a good correlation. And that's just to mention that this, there's this autopsy data which says that if we're seeing it in 10% of the population in the mid-60s, by the time you're 80, 25% of people get amyloid. The question again is, is this bystander amyloid or does it actually cause a toxic effect on the heart? And there is some evidence to show that that's the case. Um, we've done some work on aortic stenosis, people going for aortic valve surgery. It was kind of phenocopy of uh, amyloid because you have thick hearts. And when, under a research project, they were having MRIs with ECV estimation, and we found a prevalence of about 10% uh, of these patients with uh, surgical AVRs actually had amyloid. And then the outcomes are very much more worse in that group compared to those people who didn't have amyloid after their surgery for their valve. So it's out there, and it seems to harm your heart even more than just if you didn't have it. So let's talk about sarcoidosis. So we've heard it mentioned a lot even in this morning. We know that there's a geographical distribution of the disease. It's very common. And there's this, um, again, there's autopsy data to say that the cardiac involvement is very much more greater than what we suspect before people die. And it, in Japan, about 80% of those people seem to have cardiac involvement. And if you do have cardiac involvement, the mortality is 25% at five years. It can affect the heart in a whole range of ways. And the pathogenesis, what's going on, is this kind of interplay between Th1 and Th2 responses, a kind of seesawing effect between inflammation and scarring and fibrosis formation. And that is what's causing the disease process. So the, again, this is the pathology, and these activate these granuloma, these uh, 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 accumulations of activated macrophages, is what drives the process. And this is what we can see with nuclear imaging with PET scans, because activated macrophages use sugar as their energy source, and therefore take up the sugar analog tracer, which is FDG. You've already heard that biopsies know is can be patchy, and these are the clinical criteria that we use to call the study. So MRI will show the scar formed by the granulometer, but the patterns are very and many. So there's a role here for a scan which can actually show that active inflammation. Now, if you have a PET scan normally, um, you starve for six hours before you come along and get injected with radioactive glucose. If you were to ask us for a PET scan to look at cardiac viability, we exploit the fact that the heart can use sugar as its energy substrate by giving you sugar and insulin to drive the radioactive sugar into the muscle to then work out whether you've got a viable myocardium or non-viable myocardium before revascularization. What I want to do when we do these scans is have the heart not using sugar as its substrate so that I know that the sugar is being used by the activated macrophages and get the heart to use lipids and fatty acids as its source of metabolism. Now, I wish I could switch, flick a switch. I can't. So what you have to do is fool the heart by getting the patient to starve for 12 hours versus 6 hours and the day beforehand put them on the Atkins diet. So you're the cardiologist, and you've got to say you can have bacon and eggs, and you can't have pasta, and no, <laughs> and no sugar. You eat that, give them a fatty inf uh, meal, get them to starve for this long time, and hopefully the heart switches over to fatty acid metabolism. I also give a slug of heparin, because that activates li lipase agents, which also promote fatty acid metabolism by the heart. That's a belt and braces approach to this thing. And I hope, therefore, that I suppress 
the natural background physiology of the heart to use sugar. Okay, we then acquire the pictures. And these patterns are negative. And actually, the one I'm really hoping for in all of this is the one on the left, because then it's easy. There's no cardiac uptake. It's easy to make, easy to make the call. And we've seen some clinical examples here. Neha showed a great one where there was nothing going on. A negative scan. But equally, the diffuse pattern where that suppression mechanism has failed to work, we also determine as being a negative scan. This is not active myocardial inflammation. This is now a negative scan. Okay, that, the, this, this bit's a bit dizzy-making, sorry. <laughs> Whereas, positive scans, you show focal uptake, and here you can see a nice discrete uptake in the lateral wall. And on the right-hand side, you see the focal on diffuse, the very much more heterogeneous uptake within that myocardium, again with that lateral pulmonary dominance. And the other thing I, I, I hope for, so I'm crossing my fingers here, now I'm crossing my toes, is that I can actually make the diagnosis, because if you look in the lungs, there's stuff going on in the lungs. FGG is lighting up in lymph nodes or lung parenchyma, which means it's a slam dunk to make, uh, make the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. And this is just to show that it's a multi-system disease. So yes, you can get cardiac activity, but you also see the lymphadenopathy, and you also get the lung parenchymal changes of central lobular nodularity and fibrosis, which is, uh, shows active inflammation on the PET scan on the right-hand panel. So there has been, a, there's been several studies of the diagnostic accuracy of this technique. And again, sarcoid is actually an awful disease to study because, the, as we've heard, biopsy is very hard to do sometimes, and therefore there's clinical criteria to judge against. So the standard that you judge against is in itself never been prospectively validated and is quite weak. But there's full sensitivities and specificities around the 80s, 80 percent for the technique. But as clinicians, you're interested in one in making the diagnosis, then two actually trying to work out how, you know, what's the, what does it mean for the patient? So prognostication, and then possibly you want something to monitor treatment with. So this is the effect of scar on sarcoid patients, and if you've got scar versus no scar, you do worse. This is two and a half years follow-up, looking at death and uh, ICD shocking in a Boston population. And similar things have been demonstrated in, sorry, that was a German population, and this is a Boston population looking with PET here, where if you've got FDG uptake, you do worse, again, looking at death or VT. We've looked at our scans, and we can see that when we do the PET and MRI scans together in the same machine, which is what I've been showing you, that the signal of the PET and the MRI do have this basal lateral tendencies. Everything seems to seep to the heart in that basal lateral sector, but they don't actually overlap. Okay, so the PET scan and the SCAR scan of MRI are showing you different things. And then if you look at outcomes, if you have the double hit of scar and inflammation, your outcomes are much worse versus if you have none, or you do fine, and if you have one or the other. Hopefully that's projecting the colors on, on great. So again here, there's something in the, in the biology. If you've got scar with inflammation on top, you're going to do worse. That's it for sarcoid. This is a brain. Coming back to amyloid, and I'm coming back to the use of PET and MRI and imaging to make diagnoses. So where amyloid deposits and where amyloid is causing a public health you know, nightmare is going to be dementia. And tracers have been designed. All of these are actually based off Congo Red, the initial histological staining, to see whether we can make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in the brain before um, the onset of dementia. So the scan on the right-hand side is a positive scan where there's this dispersal of the tracer. In this case, the tracer is flobetapir, which Professor Molini showed us, uh, showing that the patient on the right-hand panel has got amyloid disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease. So these were designed, as again, as a, off the basis of Congo Red. So then if you can get hold of a tracer, you obviously you want to inject it and see whether you can systemically image systemic amyloidosis. So people have done that. This is carbon-11 PIB. It's a Pittsburgh-based compound, and there's various ranges of amyloid on the left-hand sides which show uptake in the heart. So this means that we may have a new technique of diagnosing the disease. And if we can combine that with MRI, where we can do extracellular volume mapping and from the late gadolinium enhancement, we will now have a fantastic sort of testbed thing for all these new traces which are coming out to work out whether we can have new techniques to make the diagnosis. And this is an example of a patient we did the other day with AL amyloid. 
and that's the use of the PET tracer in the heart. You see that she's also got similarly global uptake where she's also got the extracellular volume expansion. And the beauty of PET is that it's inherently quantifiable, so potentially this could be the technique for amyloid where we can measure the de decreases once those new treatments come on as they mop it up. So this, this is early pilot work on that. So what I want to show is that there's a vast array of tools and techniques to investigate the biology and the pathology using imaging. And hopefully the, if you use them together, then the, the patients will benefit from right answers and the opportunity to monitor their, monitor their treatment. I'd like to thank everybody back at base and thank you for listening.